welcome back to the second last iteration of our raid speedrun breakdown series. Today we are talking about none other than Root of Nightmares. Now, fun fact, before we get started, I actually did a kind of poll recently asking a bunch of D2 raid speedrunners, you know, what's your favorite raid to run? What raid looks the most fun to run? You know, what would you like to run? What do you enjoy running? And to not my surprise, at least, Root of Nightmares was ranked number one. And, um, you know, I'll explain all the mechanics and all the cool strats, and maybe you'll agree or disagree with the speedrunning community, but there's no doubt that this raid is a fun, fast-paced raid where all the encounters flow together really nicely, and there's some nice skips, there's some nice movement sections, and everybody in the team kind of contributes a very important part and can cause time loss in every single encounter. There's not a lot of waiting around either. So that's what makes for a really great raid speedrun. Um, but, you know, with that yapping out of the way, let's start with entrance. All right, let's start with the very start of the raid. And obviously you don't spawn right at first encounter like you do with some raids or uh, close to first encounter. At least you spawn quite a far distance away. So what do you need to do? Well, you might think, wouldn't everyone just go to first encounter? Well, mm, not exactly, right? So we have sick robes over here. He gets eager edge launched in the back. He pops, he rises. And what he's going to do in order to make it to first encounter very quickly, let me just lift the quality of this video here. It's a... Uh, seems YouTube is being a little bit buggy, but he is going to go ahead and do something called a barrier surf. So there is a push down barrier above Sickrobe's head right now. He's going to skate using heat rises to push himself upward and forward. And this push down barrier is going to accelerate his momentum downward and forward, pushing him back in the other direction. And you're going to see that right now when he skates right here and he's kind of going into that barrier, it pushes him forward. So that takes him a lot further than a normal eager edge skate was, you know, would normally. I'm sure if you've, you know, used an Egret Sword before, you're probably like, whoa, he's going way further than I would normally. And that's what that is. That's a barrier surf. Now, another thing Sickrobes is doing here. Now, entrance is very dense. There's like four different things going on at the same time, but I'll try to explain all of them in logical fashion. Now, you might think, you know, Sickrobes had the option to just go to first encounter just now. Why didn't he just go to first encounter or start it immediately to save as much time as possible? And the reason for that is because in Root of Nightmares, there is a checkpoint that you can hit before first encounter that automatically revives everybody in the raid. Now, I'm sure you're probably familiar with being automatically revived or auto res. At the end of most raid encounters, there is an auto res that happens where anybody who's dead gets automatically revived. You don't need to go manually res them and they just spawn right where their ghost is, right? So auto reses can be very helpful for some things in speedrunning because they interact differently than if you were to try to manually respawn yourself or if your teammate were to respawn you. Now, in this case, Sickrobes is hitting this checkpoint which auto reses everybody and he's actually gonna wait here and open his inventory, right? So he opens his inventory, switches to Agar Scepter, you'll see new objective pop in the top left of his screen and you'll notice if you look at his screen carefully in the, in the top left, this radar section, four X's are on a screen. The four of his teammates are dead and one of his teammates appears to be somewhere else, maybe out of bounds in this top right POV, you can see them there. So why have they done this? Well, let's take a look. Sickrobes is now going to start the encounter and boom, do you see that? Let me go back a little bit so you guys can you guys can catch that. You see that? All four of its teammates' reses get pulled into the first encounter starting location, right? So if you've been watching this series so far, you know that's called a death warp. A death warp is basically when you start an encounter, anybody that's dead in that encounter's load zone, their ghost gets ported all the way to the starting location, usually near where the flag is, where the raid expects you to start that encounter, right? So what is Sickrobes accomplishing by doing his kind of entrance skip this way? Well, number one, he's hitting that auto res checkpoint so his teammates can be dead, right? Other otherwise, if his teammates died early and then he hit the auto res checkpoint, well, then they would just get auto res and they would have to die again, right? So he hits this checkpoint, gives his teammates some time to die. They die. He starts the encounter. And as soon as he starts the encounter, all of his teammates orbs get ported to the start of the encounter and they can actually start doing the mechanics. You'll notice Sickrobes here actually doesn't interact with the mechanics. He just starts clearing ads. And I'll explain why clearing ads is important in this encounter, but the rest of his team is behind him. They're starting to get to work on the nodes. Okay, so that's entrance. That's pretty much all of it. Now we're going to talk about what is going on in this top right POV, right? You'll notice there's only five people in this encounter. There's Sickrobes plus his four teammates that are running around doing nodes while he clears ads. There is this person who is out of bounds, seemingly in the area between the first and second encounter in that little transition section. What are they doing there? And to answer that question, we're going to need two other POVs. So we're going to take a visit to Tall Sandy's POV right here and take a look at what's going on. So right off the bat, I want you to notice as soon as the raid starts, a Vortex immediately dies. OK, that's the person that's in front of him whose ghost is right there. Vortex is immediately going to mountaintop himself with an underlight class item, and that's going to allow him to die instantly. And you'll notice that Tall Sandy is going to sit on top of his res to block it. 
and then a bunch of crystals are going to be thrown around Vortex's body. Now, why is this? Well, the reason for this is because in Destiny 2, we've talked about this before, but I'm just going to reiterate for the people that are new to this series, there is a speedrun tech or just a tech in general called default spawn manipulation. Now, every load zone in Destiny 2, load zones are what Destiny 2 is kind of broken up into these little regions. Every time you hit a new load zone, there's that text in the bottom left that tells you where you are. In this case, the Root of Nightmares first encounter load zone is called Cataclysm, and it extends all the way to cover entrance. Now, in Cataclysm, there is a default spawn. It's right where you spawn, when you spawn into the raid, and it's actually this box. It's, it's like a rectangle on the ground, basically. You can't see it, but it exists. And if you cover it up in crystals, default spawn manipulation basically makes it so that certain load zones, for whatever reason, they have an initial default spawn, but if that default spawn is blocked off or a certain objective progresses, there's a fallback spawn that can be kind of anywhere in the load zone, depends on the load zone. And for whatever reason, right, for whatever reason, in the first encounter load zone of Ron, if you block off the default spawn like so, the fallback spawn for Ron first encounter is actually, let's go ahead and take a look for that, at that DSM POV. You'll see Vortex dies. He goes into his inventory. Let me uh, skip forward a little bit here. Oh, skip forward too far. A little bit of a spoiler. He gets rezzed by his teammate and boom, just like that. This is the fallback spawn for whatever reason for Ron's first encounter load zone. It is beyond the door after the first encounter door, right? At beyond after, after that door behind the chest where it kind of slides open after you're done with first encounter, this is the fallback spawn. So this allows Vortex to do a skip called zero two. He's going to go from the entrance of the raid all the way to the second encounter of the raid so that he can pull his teammates instantly when first encounter finishes and skip the entire transition. Now, there's a couple other things that Vortex needs to do, and we're going to go ahead and talk about that. Now, you might notice something special. If you've watched the other DSM examples that we've talked about in the past, for example, King's Fall DSM through the Golgoroth maze, or maybe Last Wish DSM, you might be thinking, you know, how come his DSM is so much faster? Well, the reason for that is because this team innovated a little bit compared to the time before theirs, which is a, a 930. This record was actually relatively recent. What Tall Sandy actually did there was he manually revived Vortex inside of the crystals. And this also works. You don't have to res yourself in order to do DSM. You can have your teammate res you. It's faster than waiting out your five second respawn timer. And that allows Vortex to just appear here magically. It's really trippy, right? Tall Sandy literally reses Vortex. And instead of, you know, Vortex's body appearing where you'd expect it to be on top of the ghost, it gets teleported all the way over here. So DSM can in fact be done by manually reviving someone as long as their ghost is being blocked and so is that entire spawn box. Now, we're going to go ahead and watch Vortex pull off a little bit of cool tech here for DSM. Let me go ahead and lift the quality of this video. For some reason, my YouTube defaults are being buggy, probably because my connection is so bad. But nonetheless, we're going to watch Vortex do a little bit of a transition. And so this looks pretty normal, right? He's, he's just going to second encounter. Oh, wait, why is he turning around? Okay, so I want you to notice one thing. Remember how I talked about how load zones, when you enter a new load zone, there's new text in the bottom left of your screen. Vortex just entered the second encounter load zone, which is called Decision. And for some reason, he's making a U-turn here. Now, there's an interesting property of load zones in Destiny 2, where if you get joining allies, because an encounter that a load zone you know, is surrounding uh, or a load zone contains is trying to pull you by giving you joining allies, you can cancel the joining allies timer or refresh it back up to five seconds by dipping into the load zone from an adjacent load zone. So that was a lot of words. What do I mean by this? So we talked about in Ron, there's first encounter load zone, Cataclysm. Second encounter load zone, Scission. Vortex went to the Scission load zone, right? So let me go ahead and draw this. I drew this for DSE as well, but let me go ahead and draw this, right? Load zones have this mutual area where if you enter a load zone, right? If you go this way through a load zone, then the load zone will act like this, right? However, if you were to go into, let's say load zone B from load zone A, right? Let's say you go into load zone B and you come back, then load zone B will act like this. So there's a kind of mutual area called a hub that load zones share. So what is Vortex doing? Vortex is going deep enough through this hub so that he can hit the second encounter load zone. Then when he comes back from the second encounter load zone, he's going to dip ever so briefly inside the first encounter load zone and immediately U-turn. And the reason for that is because the reason why some skips are possible in Destiny is because certain load zones, right, or certain encounters, I should say, the joining allies isn't infinite, okay? So a lot of encounters, the joining allies persist throughout the entire encounter until the encounter is over, okay? Some encounters, on the other hand, their joining goes away after maybe 10 seconds or 11 seconds. And because of this, you can do something called a joining cancel, right? So he's going to, as you can see, his joining allies goes up from, you know, two to five, and he's going to go ahead and continue this transition all the way into Scission once again and his joining allies is going to disappear. It becomes turn back instead. 
Now turn back, it's turn back because he is away from the encounter, but th that means that the joining allies is gone, right? So now that the joining allies is gone, he doesn't get pulled back to the previous encounter. He dies in the second encounter load zone, and when he respawns, in just a second here, his turn back is gone. And so now the joining allies is gone, the turn back is gone, and Vortex can trudge his way with no well all the way to the second encounter of the raid. Now, one more thing before we finish up with watching this POV, we're going to go back to first encounter, of course, and I'm going to explain that. But one more thing before we uh, leapfrog back to, to first encounter, Vortex is going to have to hit a checkpoint in between the first and second encounter. I'm going to show you where that is right now. We're going to skip over. Yeah, it's just in this room over here. If you've seen older speedruns of this raid where more people did this transition, you would have one person go back to hit this checkpoint. Thankfully, this checkpoint is what we call a retroactive checkpoint meaning that the game will check for the checkpoint even though you've hit it prior to when it has checked for it. So basically, Vortex can hit it now. When first encounter ends and the game looks for a player to hit this checkpoint, if he's already hit it in the past, it will still count as hitting the checkpoint. So it's a retroactive checkpoint. He's going to go ahead and rally. And now he gets the AFK for like 30 seconds, waiting for his teammates to finish first encounter. So that's 0-2. That's 0-1, which is what Sickrose was doing to get to the first encounter. And we also talked about the Death Warp, which is how they efficiently start the first encounter, getting all their reses there. The only downside is, of course, that they don't have a flag. You're actually going to notice here something funny, okay? Now, uh, raid encounters are very, very synonymous, uh, very well associated with rally flags, right? In this encounter, I think, or so not in this encounter, in this raid, I think a total of two rally flags get placed, okay? There's one at the start of second encounter and only one person get it gets it and that's vortex because he has time he's he's here he's rallying to the flag he's just sitting there right the other one is at nezarek and that's only because the flag can temporarily be made to persist for longer than it normally does and that's literally it there's no other rallies in this in this raid which is pretty interesting it's just kind of from front to back just uh just straight almost no rallying so that's pretty cool um okay so that's basically it for entrance. Let's move on to Cataclysm. And for that, we're going to go to Sick Robes POV. Now, I'm sure a lot of people have their gripes with the first two encounter of Ron. Uh, a lot of people do like the third encounter because everybody's kind of involved. But in like an LFG setting, uh, Ron has both upsides and downsides, right? It's a kind of a double edged sword because the first two encounters, they're designed in such a way that if you have every single player on your team on the same page doing a very specific optimized role, then they flow like water, right? It's a very, very cool moving system, very, very natural, right? But if you have a bunch of people that have, you know, just, just met each other or like, like an LFG, kind of a ragtag group, then it's even less efficient to have more people on mechanics because there's more clutter, you know, different strategy, communication issues, stuff like that. So because of that, this raid is really beloved by speedrunners because, you know, who optimizes and makes customized roles for raids more than speedrunners do? Whereas in LFG, if you're just meeting random people, then it's kind of hard to assign roles to six separate people and have the raid still go smoothly. So let's talk about the, the flip side of that coin, which is of course speedrunning, where everybody has an extremely specific role on this encounter. Okay, now this encounter, I'm going to try to explain it in a kind of idea where you have like cycles. Okay, at the start of the encounter, you have to do nodes and then you have ad clear and then you have nodes and then you have ad clear and then you have nodes, et cetera, et cetera. You do these kind of cycles, right? The node section, Players, how do they speed it up? Well, obviously everybody has specific nodes and buffs that they go to shoot, but there are specific rules that nodes and buffs adhere to. Now there's a bit of RNG in terms of which previous plate can be the buff and which future nodes can be the node, like which future plates will contain nodes. And in order to circumvent this RNG, this team had to develop very, very specific routing to the point where certain people in the later section, so this is section one, right? There's four sections of nodes in first encounter. Certain people in the third and fourth sections of this encounter have to learn multiple different roles and routes depending on the RNG of the previous sections. So that's something that a lot of previous teams kind of avoided because it would overcomplicate roles. But this team was like, you know what? Screw it. We're trying to, trying to go for the fastest possible time. Let's hyper optimize this and make sure that everybody, no matter what RNG we get, knows exactly what they're doing, even if it means having to learn multiple different routes and roles and react to the changes of RNG in the encounter. So what do I mean by RNG? Well, in certain areas, in certain sections of this encounter, a node might be on one plate, but it might be on another plate as well. It's like a 50-50. Or a buff might be on one plate, or it might be on a different plate. And depending on that, these players, they have a strategy where they actually bring buff from previous sections to the next section in order to shoot it instantly without moving from the home plate buff all the way to a new node. So what do I mean by that? Kind of complicated what I just said. Let me actually show you. 
So Sickrobe's here, right? He uses his buff, and now Sickrobe still has this field of light buff for 15 seconds. Now, normally, if you were to do this in an LFG, people would disregard this because obviously, you know, the ad clear is going to be slow and you're probably not going to have your buff for the next section. But these guys are so fast that the next section starts and Sickrobes can actually use his lingering buff from a previous section and carry it over to the next section and just immediately shoot a node like so. So this is a relatively new strat, uh, you know, came out within the last maybe two iterations of Root of Nightmare speedrunning strategies. So something really cool. Obviously, it's very it's very punishing, right? You have to be very fast on your ad clear and your sections to actually get this to work, but very rewarding because you don't have to have people sword from plates to buffs for certain sections, right? Now, I did mention that there's cycles, right? You have your cycle of finishing nodes and buffs, and then you have your cycle of ad clear. Now, before this team ran, it was assumed that when you finished a node section, right? So let me go back a little bit here, right? Let's see here, right? It says his hatred halts. They just finished one section. People assumed, right, it was timed that after you get Hatred Halts, even if you kill all of the adds, you have a minimum of 11 seconds before the next section blooms and you're able to shoot those buffs and notes. Now, what this team found out is that if you kill all of the adds and then you kill the Scions as well, the next section will instantly start. But if you kill the Scions and you haven't killed all the adds, then nothing happens. So what you can do to actually speed this raid up even, even more it's in, unlike acquisition, for example, we talked about how in Vow first encounter, after every single obelisk input on the first encounter, you have to wait 15 seconds. And as long as you clear all the ads in the encounter by that 15 second mark, you're not going to lose any time. Well, this team found out that 11 second thing is not really a thing. You can kill the scions as well. And then boom, you instantly get the next section to start, right? Which is obviously excellent. You can save a couple seconds every section if you have really, really good ad clear, but you have to be careful about it, right? So that's another thing. That's why ad clear is so important. That's why all of these guys are on Sunbracers, Forbearance. They're, you know, on Starfire. They're basically all spreading out. And now I mentioned Sunbracers and Starfire, right? On top of that, not only do these guys have to basically focus on these very, very, you know, difficult, customized node routing that they have to remember every single section. They have to react to different RNG. They have to clear ads really fast, but they're also farming their wells this entire time, right? So there's kind of three things that are racing through your mind while you're doing this encounter. I got to do my nodes right. I got to I gotta do my buffs nodes right. I got to make sure I don't cause disrupts. I got to make sure my movement is clean. I'm getting to my nodes on time. I have to make sure I'm clearing the ads on time so that when the scions die, we can go to that next section right away and I can keep my buff and not run out of my time from the previous section and on top of that i have to farm my super and towards the end of this encounter they're also going to make special finishers so they have ammo for second encounter because obviously they don't get a flag right and if you've seen second encounter and ron speed running there's a lot of well skating going on and you can't well skate without a well right so these guys are doing a lot of things at the same time but that's basically it for first encounter it's a repeat on the second section on the third section on the fourth section the third and fourth section obviously having the most plates have the most rng and the most kind of complexity when it comes to the routing but you can imagine kind of how it goes i'm not going to explain the specific rules that come to determining routes because that's a little too specific and not really necessary to understand but i hope you kind of get the idea of what's going on in terms of speedrunning strategy here everybody has specific nodes buffs that they go to and people have to react to callouts if you ever listen to this run which again i'll link the run in the description of my video you can go watch all six povs there they're calling out one two three go four go five go they're calling out basically over and over so people know exactly when to shoot the buffs without looking at their teammates so very very fast moving process first and second encounter are a beauty to watch in speedrunning for similar reasons they're very fast paced everybody has to be on the bowl and um besides the skipper obviously everybody's kind of playing an equal part all right so that's basically it for first encounter uh, I'm gonna skip kind of past the rest of this. Obviously, they don't spawn like tormentors or stuff like that. They gotta nuke the champs. I mean, yeah, that, this is pretty much it. I'm just gonna skip past here. Most of them have their wells or are almost at the point where they have their wells. And um, now we're gonna actually transfer over to a different POV. We're gonna go ahead and watch Vortex's POV because he's gonna be pulling everybody to the second encounter. So let's skip over here a little bit. Vortex is big chilling under this node, under this buff here. He's going to go ahead and shoot it, pull his teammates, and he's going to instantly start well skating across to start this encounter. Now, second encounter is a little bit different from first encounter. Notice how during first encounter, I said the complexity comes from the routing, the memorization, the reacting to the RNG. Second encounter is a different beast, right? Second encounter, the routing is completely consistent. The nodes always spawn in the same order. There's obviously two sets of buffs, so you have people going crossing sides, doing this, doing that, whatever. 
that's different, right? But every single time the node order, the buff order is always going to be the same. So people can have specific roles that they do, right? And there's no like, oh, if it's this buff, then you have to do this role. So that's a little bit simpler. However, this encounter, add clear is a nightmare. Add clear is way harder in this encounter than the previous encounter for a number of reasons. Number one, the floors, they go from back to front, front to back, right? You're traveling across an area. In Root of Nightmares first encounter in Cataclysm, right? You're basically staying in one section. All the adds are, you know, spawning in predictable areas and they're not really moving as long as you kill them right away. In second encounter, you might have adds spawning from a door all the way at the start of the floor. You know, when you're finishing a floor and if you don't kill that add early on, it's going to jump to you and it's going to come late. And obviously you can't activate the elevators and go to the next floor or start the next floor to begin with if you don't kill all the ads on a single floor. So the ad clear is way more sensitive here. These guys, not only do they have to well skate very quickly from node to node to node and buff to buff to buff, but they also have to make sure they're clearing ads in between each. So Vortex's POV is a great example of this. He's going to go ahead and shoot a buff and now he's going to help kill some of these ads, right? He, he sunbracers some of those ads on the side that he was on. He's going to shoot here. He's going to use his eager edge sword, boom, and then boom, he's going to kill even more ads, kill even more ads, right? Any moment of downtime you have here, you're going to be using it to kill as many ads as possible, right? Now, there is a little bit of not necessarily RNG, but adaptation that needs to happen between players in this encounter, because certain floors, you may be doing a certain role, but on the so for example, right? There are, I think there are 10 nodes slash buff slash, so like actions, shooting actions that you need to do per floor per side, right? And so one, one, uh, one floor, you might be doing one, four, seven, ten. But on the next floor, you might be doing two, five, eight. And on the next floor, you might be doing three, six, nine, right? So there is some adaptation here where maybe one floor, you might be skipping to do an early floor. And then the next floor, you're not skipping to do an early floor. And the next floor, you're dealing with a champ. And the next floor, you're nuking a mini boss. So there is some variation in terms of what people do from floor to floor to floor here. And that kind of increases the complexity of what they're trying to accomplish here. Now, of course, there's champs here. In terms of weapon choice, it's similar to first encounter. You have anti-barrier sidearm. The rocket sidearm from this season is obviously very strong for this. Uh, they're using agar scepter uh, or the sidearm to shoot their buffs, their nodes, etc. Trace rifles are very good for that. And um, some of them are even on stuff like until it's returned to nuke the mini bosses in this encounter as well. Now, something I did want to show you, there's two strategies I believe I want to talk about um, before we move on from this encounter, right? So obviously everybody's well skating back and forth. They have very, very specific planned out routes, but there's two things that are a little bit unique. Number one is early floors. Okay, so Tall Sandy, whose POV I'm going to steal from here, he does something called early floors and we're gonna go ahead and take a look at what that means. Now, if you weren't aware in this encounter, even if, even if you haven't taken the elevator up to the next floor, as soon as all of the ads are killed on the first floor, the second floor nodes slash buffs activate. So you'll see here, as soon as energy travels upward appears on his screen, so all the ads are down on the bottom floor, he can instantly start the second floor. So this is a little bit of time save because the first single node that you have to shoot on every floor is across the way. So if you can get one person on each side, so in this case, I clear ads and tall Sandy on their respective sides, they can start well lining across and doing that kind of uh, long-ish duration kind of segment while their teammates are taking the elevators to go up. So it's a little bit of time save to have this kind of early floor situation. And obviously you don't need three people to nuke a mini boss that spawns, you know, and, and get the buff and stuff like that. Only two people can do that just fine. One person can come up here and do this section a little bit faster. Okay, so that's early floors. Another thing is early buffing, right? Early buffing, I'm not sure if I really have a good POV of this, but basically what early buffing is, is that you can shoot the buffs. So notice how, right? I mean, I'm sure you guys are fully aware of this if you've done this raid before, but notice how at the end of every section, these ads, like the redolence of decay, like these ads, they require you to have buff in order to kill them, right? Now, what you can do is shooting certain buffs at a certain time, right before the nodes complete, you can get the buff early. So a lot of people, what they will do in like LFGs is that they'll wait around in the final buff plate and then they'll shoot it, they'll get buff, and then they'll use that buff to kill the mini boss, right? But that takes time because the mini boss is spawned in for a while and then you can shoot the buff. So what Sick Robes does here, oh, I think Sick Robes POV actually does do this. Yeah, this is this is excellent. Okay, great. So Sick Robes is gonna use his buff here and then watch, he's gonna go back, he's gonna get this Flux of Darkness, right? And by using this early buff right now, He's not going to shoot any nodes. Notice, he's not using his buff and depleting it on any nodes. Instead, he's using it to clear these ads that have these shields without actually going into that buff section at the end and wasting his time. And now he can just instantly just nuke this guy with a surrounded until it's returned. And bang, the floor is already done just like that. Okay, now 
this encounter, uh, I'm not going to spoil too much. If you're excited to watch it yourself, I would highly recommend watching it yourself. But the next two floors are basically the same thing. Just well skating across, staggering your node buff timings so that everybody kind of gets equal distributions. I mean, this is a pleasure to watch. I'm not going to show you the whole thing, though, because the next floor, next two floors are, again, largely similar to the first floors. You kind of just have people alternating, leapfrogging each other and doing this well skating routing. All right, so that's pretty much it for second encounter. Um, let's talk about the first puzzle, the first uh, jumping puzzle. So the transition, we're also gonna talk about the nodes themselves. So what do these guys do at the end of the encounter? And to nobody's surprise, the first jumping puzzle and the second jumping puzzle both have very particular routing that every player takes. So look at this, Sickrobes is going to make his way to the very first kind of node here. And as soon as he is told to shoot it, he shoots it, boom, and another guy finishes the puzzle and boom, just like that, they're in and out of that puzzle, right? So again, even, even the, the transition sections between every single encounter here, they're kind of optimized down to a T for six people, right? Normally in an LFG, you have maybe four stragglers during this section and two guys are kind of just, you know, duoing, soloing each side, right? And it's kind of just a, a chore, right? Everybody sits at the end. In speedrunning, everybody kind of has their one sixth of the raid that they're doing, right? Everybody's kind of chipping in and doing their own individual section, okay? So that's what make the, makes this raid kind of a conundrum, right? It's got kind of a, a dichotomy going on, right? It's like, on one hand, it's a great speedrunning raid because you can divide all the work up so perfectly. But on the other hand, because it's so difficult to divide up the work efficiently, it's very difficult for LFGs to kind of, you know, come to terms with that. Now, this next section is a beautiful well skating transition, one of speedrunners most beloved transitions. It's called Ron 2-3, obviously it's because, you know, between second and third encounter. And I'm going to switch to our friend Troy's POV here, and that's because Troy is doing something a bit odd on this transition, to say the least. Now, everybody is kind of doing their own route on this transition, but for some reason, Troy has Vergless Curve on. Now, if you're not familiar with Vergless Curve, it's a bow that you can use to create stasis crystals out of thin air as long as you get a kill to charge it up beforehand. And so what 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 is Troy doing? He's, he's just randomly stopping during the transition. He's he's admiring the scenery, getting a hail barrage stack on his Vergless Curve. Well, you'll see what he's about to do in just a second. So everybody's kind of spread out on this transition. Everybody's kind of taking a slightly different route. So nobody has any collision issues. We see our friend Vortex here. He's going to make his way on top of this building. He's going to hit this nice little well bounce. Go straight up this beautiful rock slant. He's going to make his way up to this pillar with the rest of his teammates. And then he's going to do one final well skate all the way to the end of the transition. And just like that, boom. Vortex is at the end. His teammates not too far behind. The Corolla pulling up and boom, just like that. 2-3 is over. So you might be asking yourself, this guy's this guy's a hail barrage, right? He's he's got a he's got a stasis crystal ready to make. What is he doing with it? Well, this door only opens when everybody is right next to it. And unfortunately, there's not really any objects that you can well skate off of right next to this door. So if, in theory, you wanted to skip the rally flag, which Spoiler alert, I guess they, they do skip the rally flag. But if you wanted to skip the rally flag and get into the encounter as quickly as possible, what would you do to create something to well skate? Well, you create a Vergless Curve Crystal. And that's exactly what Vortex does. So he makes a Vergless Curve Crystal. The second the door opens, he well skates right in there and he switches to his Atkir loadout and boom, he is in this business. He is just nuking the Centurions. The Centurions need to die in order to spawn in the Colossi. Now, be aware, if you've watched any previous Root of Nightmares world record speedruns, besides anything that starts with a 9, so any 10 runs, any 11 runs, you may have seen that everybody kind of goes to the flag, rallies to the flag, they're like, okay, is everyone ready? Everyone has ammo, then you start the encounter. Now, this sandbox allows us to be in a place where Cenotaph Mask and Aeon exist in the same sandbox, and because of that, because of the sheer number of mini bosses you also get during this encounter, who cares if you don't have heavy ammo, right? The only downside here is that certain people are not going to be able to be on something like Strand to increase damage, but that doesn't end up mattering because the damage strategy they're going to use is so high output and so weapon based that it doesn't matter that all of them are on solar and it doesn't matter that none of them get a rally. But I'm skipping a little bit ahead of myself here. Let's talk about the encounter itself. So Explicator, I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with this because in LFG, everyone's kind of involved in this except for the people kind of doing ad clear in the middle, but you have four people, you know, four triangles. And what they're doing here is because this ad, this encounter is ad clear sensitive, right? This encounter is ad clear sensitive, meaning that the reason why they started the encounter the second that door opened and they all well skated in is because all the scions that are kind of praying to the explicator right when the door opens, you need to kill a majority of those in order to start spawning in more ads to spawn in the centurions to spawn in the colossi. 
So it is in your best interest, if you're a speedrunner, if you don't need ammo, to just start the encounter and nuke the ads immediately as quickly as possible. So some of these guys, I'm not going to show you them, but some of these guys are on Cloud Strike. And the second the door opens, they Cloud Strike the Scions, and boom, the Lightning Strike kills a bunch of them. And that's basically how you start the encounter as quickly as possible while spawning in all of the you know, prerequisite ads to get those Colossi spawn in as quickly as possible. Now, there's a couple other cool strats besides just nuking the ads and starting the encounter as quickly as possible that I do want to talk about, all right? So number one, everybody is on a sword at the start of the encounter, right? Nobody switches to a rocket early. Everybody is on a sword. And so we're going to go to Sickrobe's POV here, right? He is just kind of skating in, right? And what is he doing? He is blinding his Colossi and he is just sword skating his planet straight across. Obviously, what's the fastest way to move the planets across so that you can index them? It's to skate them across, right? So some people are well skating off the top areas. Sickrobes is just regular skating off the bottom since it's a shorter distance to cover and you don't want to track any of the ads. And now what are they doing? Well, why haven't they killed some of the Colossi? You might be wondering, why haven't they started killing some of the Colossi? Well, another strategy that this team is using is something called early reading. So I'm sure you're familiar, right? With the initial triangles when the Colossi first spawn, if you kill them, you get the ability to read the planets on your side, right? So you can see the odd one out. You can call it out to your teammates across the way. Now, you only need one person on each side to actually get the callouts, right? So technically speaking, you don't need to kill all four Colossi. So what these guys actually discovered is that if you kill the Colossi, right? If you kill a Colossus at a certain moment after the planets are indexed, right? You can actually see the mid planets ahead of time. So I don't know if Sickrobe's POV is going to do this in particular. I'm not sure. It doesn't look like he's going to, right? I think he kills it a little bit too early, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, because he can't see the mid he can't see the mid planets right now. I, yeah, I think one of his other teammates are hostaging a Colossus so that they can kill it and then read the mid plates early, right? So you're gonna see here the planets index. Oh, I think Sickrobe's actually did do it. Yeah, I think Sickrobe's actually did do it. So yeah, you can see here that Sickrobe's is already able to read the mid planets. So let's see here in a second. He has planetary insight. Boom, just like that, he can already read the mid planets, and yet the Colossus literally just started spawning, right? They literally just started spawning. So if you were to do this normally, you'd have to wait, kill a Colossus, get inside again, and then you'd be able to read. But because Sickrobes hostage this Colossus early, he's able to read immediately, and his teammates are able to start sorting the these planets into the middle. Okay? So let me go ahead and read my notes here, make sure I'm not missing anything. I contacted this team early on uh, to try and talk about the strats and make sure I'm not missing anything. So because I wanted to do this raid, you know, just this because I'm not super familiar with some of the most, most recent strats. OK, so obviously Sickrobes has switched to a rocket here. So have the rest of his teammates. They're shooting uh, all the bricks that have been made from the finishers and the cenotaph marking. And now we're going to move on to damage and early crystal. So what I mean by early crystal? Well, you can actually start damage early, it seems. Uh, this team kind of notified me. Uh, you're actually able to start damage early if you shoot the crystal in the middle at just the right time after you do the mid plates. So I believe it's right here. He's going to go ahead and shoot that crystal at a very specific timing. And boom, just like that, the boss has already started hopping down right now. Boom. And now these guys, you're going to see them do Lumina plus Izzy and a bunch of people on Reign of Fire and Recon Bait and Switch Rockets. And the cool thing about Rockets is that um, rockets are normally balanced in Destiny 2 by the fact that they're single mag weapons and the developers assume that if you want to use them, you're going to reload them manually. But because Reign of Fire reloads all of your weapons in an instant, in just an Icarus dash, right? You can shoot three rockets at max fire rate, which is some of the highest burst damage in the game, and it's all weapon damage, right? So none of these guys have to be on like Strand Titan or Solar Hunter with Nighthawk and lose time on transition by having someone rejoin. All of them get to be on Solar, Solar Warlock, right? Which means they have good movement. And on the next section, they have their wells if they need to well skate on the transition. And they still get to do a crap load of damage using Reign of Fire. So as you can see, in just the first plate, they nuke him all the way to like half his health, half his main damage uh, health bar. And then boom, one, two, three. And there you go. That is a beautiful two plate. Now, two plate is not super easy anymore after rockets got, uh, you know, pack hunter got nerfed, but they managed to pull it off in this run. And now we are going to look at final sand damage. Now, in the top right, you'll notice someone is doing some some devious things on the side of the map. But let's quickly just look at final sand damage because it's basically just an Izzy, you know, some rockets. Boom, boss falls over. Pretty straightforward, right? That's final stand damage. Let's go ahead and take a look at what is going on in the top right corner of our screen, okay? So, 
There's actually three skips that happen from third encounter to fourth encounter, okay? It's kind of similar to Valve the Disciple, actually. In Valve the Disciple, you have one person leave on what's called early 3-4, and then you have two people leave on what's called late 3-4. And the exact same skip structure happens in, um, in this raid for actually the exact same reason. So, I'm sure you guys are familiar. When you guys approach Nezarek, he doesn't instantly start the encounter when you get there for the first time, right? There's a cutscene that plays out, blah, 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 blah. You can place the flag during the cutscene if you want, but the encounter is not startable the second you get there is what I'm trying to say. You need to sit through this time period before the encounter actually starts, right? So in the same way, Rulk's cocoon, you have to approach it before the encounter actually starts. It opens, he does his animation, taunts you a bit, and then he starts the encounter and you start getting darkness. So for the exact same reason, you have one person leave on skip early, and that's Tall Sandy. So we're going to skip over to Tall Sandy's POV while I'm yapping away. And then more people will join up with Tall Sandy and skip later so that they can participate in the encounter right away, even if they weren't there to start the cutscene, because you only need one person to start the cutscene, right? So let's go ahead and take a look at Tall Sandy's skip. This is something that was discovered kind of late into the raid's development, I would say, later into the raid's development, right? But this is a really cool skip route, right? You can breach through the stair using a stasis crystal. There's other routing that you can do as well, but this is a little bit faster than the old routing. And now Tall Sandy is going to make his way all the way up to the tip of the spike. He's going to switch to mountaintop and an underlight class item so he can kill himself as quickly as possible at a certain moment. You're going to see that in just a second. He's going to well skate here and avoid this pushback barrier on the left side of his screen. Right, it's going to try to push him back in, but he's going to make his way around it. And boom, he's going to do a barrier serve. So there's a push barrier here right now that's like this and it's pushing him to the right. So if he skates this way, it'll boomerang him out this way. So that's what he's aiming to do right now. And it does just that. It pushes him all the way back in, right? Stumbles a little bit on a ledge. And now he's going to hit a load zone, right? This is the fourth encounter load zone. It's also called Cataclysm. And he's going to die, right? So we've seen this before. This is called default spawn exploitation, not manipulation. And what default spawn exploitation is, is when you hit a load zone and you die and you don't set your res anywhere, the game has to put you somewhere, right? And the somewhere, in this case, the default spawn of Cataclysm when you first hit it is in fact, wait for it, inbounds. It's inbounds right here at the start of the transition behind the little flower petals that open up after the second jumping puzzle. So you might be asking, right? Your first question, if you're speedrun inclined, might be, well, if they can do this for the 3-4 transition between 3rd and 4th encounter, why didn't they do this for the 2-3 transition, right? Like, can you not just skip out of bounds to get to 3rd encounter early and pull everyone? Unfortunately, no, that's not the case. Um, the entire jumping puzzle is filled with turn back until you finish the first uh, node puzzle between the 2nd and 3rd encounter. So you can't do that for 2-3, but for whatever reason, you can do it for 3-4. There's no turn back here, even though the, jump, uh, the puzzle hasn't finished. And um, not everybody has to, has to participate in the puzzle for this reason. So because of that, Paul Sandy can just make his way to the fourth encounter ASAP. He's going there right now. He's going to do this wonderful, beautiful skip. All of Root of Nightmare skips are just nice, fresh, open air, very unique terrain, very interesting to look at. So very cool. I don't know why he just put didn't swap right. <laughs> I guess he's he's telling you why he made a mistake on his on his skip here. He's on his way through this this tight little section between the tentacles, barely escapes his turn back, and right when he right when that puzzle finishes, he is there to start boom they they just finish that puzzle right they just finished that puzzle so he's able to make it here right now so another question you might be asking is why have three people skip forward and have three people stay back why not have four people skip forward or five people skip forward well this team along with other teams decided to strike a balance right you either you have a slow puzzle you have a slow node puzzle because remember there's a puzzle that needs to be finished between third and fourth encounter before you can actually start Nazarek, right so either you have a slow puzzle and you have more people skip so more people can start the encounter and start doing mechanics right away, or you have a faster uh, puzzle, but you have less people skip, right? So it turns out doing it 3-3 is kind of the optimal way to balance players. That way, you have one person who can get there to cut, start the cutscene, and they, they can also place the flag, right? You have one person who can start on left and one, peeper, one, people, <laughs> one person who can start on right. Right? So that's just the right number of people to start the encounter and just the right number of people to finish puzzle. And as you can see, it ends up being pretty much perfect, right? Tall Sandy arrives at the encounter right when they finish the second puzzle. They're going to make it here and he is just going to start that encounter right away. Boom, objective updates. Nezarek is doing his yapping and Tall Sandy is going to place what we call a temp perma. Okay. Now, if you remember, Vaults of Glass, Garden of Salvation, blah, blah, blah. Tons of different raids have perma flags in them, right? So you can place a flag and it will exist through the entirety of the encounter and any teammates that are in the raid, when you place that flag, they'll be able to rally whenever they want. Obviously they can't rally multiple times, but they can still rally delay, right? The flag doesn't disappear basically. Now, 
what a temp perma is, is in newer raids, Bungie basically patched out perma. You can't perma normally in most new raids. I'm sure you remember in Val the Disciple and Caretaker during day one, a lot of people, they place perma flags by shooting the crystal on the first floor and placing the flag at a specific time. And so then they could go back down and get ammo and have more ammo for second floor. Bungie saw this and they were like, eh, -eh. okay, in future raids, you're not going to be allowed to do this. They basically made it so that the game checks a second time if you've placed a flag and deletes it even later on. So there's no possible timing where you can place a flag and not have it get erased by the encounter. However, this second check is very delayed. And so you can do something called a temp perma, where if Patal Sandy starts the encounter and places the flag at just the right moment, the flag will persist for like two or three seconds and his teammates can rally to it and then it will disappear. So you're gonna see that in just a second here. Nezarek is gonna do his yapping, blah, 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 I'm the god of pain, blah, blah, blah. You know, this is your, you know, your final death, blah, blah, blah. You know, he's, he's yapping. He slams his foot on the ground, Tall Sandy holds E, and boom, you're gonna see that flag doesn't disappear. And his teammates behind him, they're gonna death warp in, which I'll show you in a second. They're gonna death warp in, and they will be able to rally before the flag disappears. Okay? That's Tall Sandy's job, right? I'll show you late 3 4 as well. That's gonna be Sick Robes POV. Okay? So, what do I mean by late 3 4? Instead of doing an out of bounds transition, Sick Robes is actually gonna do an inbounds transition. So, he's gonna go ahead and get some heavy ammo. Encounter is ended. He's gonna well skate through this opening door, and he's gonna go inbounds, right? And this allows some of the people on this role to kind of help out with the puzzle if they need to. I don't think this team is having them help out with the puzzle. They're just kind of going straight there because uh, their puzzle is very optimized with just three people. Sikrobes is uh, going to fall on a little root here and he's going to make his way all the way to the fourth encounter while still being able to help with final stand, unlike Tall Sandy, and still get that very fast final stand, which is just uh, a simple two rockets, right? So Sikrobes is going to make his way here and you'll see... Let me show you just what the temp perma looks like, right? So he is going to go ahead and you'll see him start the encounter and boom, he's going to change his loadout and he's still going to have time to rally, right? So that's the power of a temp perma. The perma will disappear eventually in like three or four seconds, but he has time to rally, which is the important part. Now, let me show you the death warp, right? I believe Corolla is part of the death warp team, right? So Corolla is helping out with the puzzle, right? Let me go ahead and put this on HD so you guys can see a little bit better, right? So Corolla has just finished his side of the puzzle. And now you'll see in just a second here, as soon as this opened, he's going to well skate and he is going to die right here. Oh, he dies with a fusion aid. That's interesting. Most people, most people don't die with a fusion aid. Okay. So there you go. You see that Corolla has entered the Cataclysm load zone, the fourth encounter load zone where Nazarek is. And because of this, just like at the start of the raid, he is dead in the same load zone as an encounter that's about to start. And so when the encounter does in fact start, where is Corolla's res going to go? Wait for it. Wait for it. Okay, Nesrek is taking a sweet time. Okay, there you go. Boom. Just like that. It's like magic, right? He gets teleported all the way across the entire jumping puzzle. He death warps, and now he's able to respawn by the flag. And just like that, boom, it's his rally. And that's all there is for that. Okay, so that's pretty much it. I'm not going to show you how to do second puzzle because, you know, you can imagine how they're doing second puzzle. They have an optimized order where certain people get certain buffs and nodes. It's the same thing as first puzzle, which is the same thing as second encounter, which is, you know, you know, you know what I'm saying. Okay, I don't really need to explain. So, we're also going to talk about, um, I guess, a little bit of Nezarek. Yeah, Nezarek. Uh, Nezarek is... So, a lot of people complain that Root of Nightmares uses its node mechanics very similarly across all four encounters. Uh, it's, a, it's a little bit like that. I mean, the first encounter, again, lots of RNG, lots of routing issues, lots of routing problems that you have to solve. Second encounter, it's ad clear that's the problem, and there's no RNG. Fourth encounter is a little bit of both. There's a little bit of RNG and a little bit of ad clear. So there's a little bit of both. And of course you have a boss that's kind of breathing down your neck and shooting void cleaves at you, which is also annoying as well. So what do they do to manage this effectively? Well, Corolla, he's going to participate in nodes. He's also going to get hatred and sick robe since he had a well left over from his transition um, while Corolla is getting hatred here, which you're going to see he gets hatred. Obviously, we don't want our, our lovely friend Corolla to die. Sikrobus has placed as well here for him so that he doesn't die. And Corolla is going to grab Hatred and bring Nezarek over to damage. Now, normally this isn't a problem because if you do an LFG, after you're done all the nodes, Nezarek takes like 90 years to start damage. And so he's eventually going to waddle his way over to you. These guys, funny story about, you know, Ron fourth encounter. It's like DSC fourth encounter, right? It's like Tanix. Because in Tanix, if you kill all of the adds instantly, damage starts right away. A lot of people don't know that. Same thing with Nezarek. If you kill all of the adds in Nezarek instantly, damage starts right away. 
So, because they're killing all the ads right away, if Nezarek is off in Neverland, whenever you start damage, well, you're not gonna have a fun time damaging him because he's like a kilometer away, right? So, why do you take Hatred? You take Hatred so you guarantee Nezarek is by the by the top left flower when damage is about to start, which it will start very quickly here in just a second. The nodes have just finished, and boom, he's damageable, just like that, right? It's very, very fast, very, very quick. You almost don't even have time to swap loadouts if you need to for damage. So that is why these players decide to take Hatred and draw him to top left. Another thing that's very important, you're going to notice everybody is social distancing from Nezarek, right? Nobody is at the front of the flower, right? Nezarek is a very particular boss. If you are not careful, right, he will jump on you and slam you if you're close to the edge of the flower. So everybody has to kind of keep their distance here. They're all using bait and switch rockets, needle storm, you know, Lumina. They're using traces to pick up ammo, to proc bait. But this boss doesn't have that much health. So everybody's just able to kind of spam rockets. Then, of course, you also have horsemen for final stand. And the boss is cooked. Absolutely cooked. Okay, let me go ahead and take a look at my notes, make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, yeah, some of the runners are on swords right now, and um, there's finishers being made off like the min middle Colossus guys, you know, same thing, same concept as third encounter, right? And some people are running on swords, you want them to have ammo for uh, for damage, so, you know, you just, uh, you you make some finishers in the middle, you send a tap mark some of the people in the middle, that way those people can make ammo, or get ammo, while they're coming across, and uh, switch to rockets, alright? That's basically it uh, for Ronald, for Ronald McDonald's. Um, I'm looking through my notes right now. I can just show you guys my notes if you're interested. This is what I do every time I make a video like this. I write down all of the little stuff I need to talk about for every single encounter. Uh, Ron is a very, very cool raid to watch, right? Um, it's almost designed for speedrunning, I would say, which is kind of a weird thing because Bungie typically doesn't design things for speedrunning. I, I'm not, I don't mean to say that they explicitly designed it for speedrunning, but it's, it's a very interesting raid because all of its mechanics can be divided so precisely into six equal parts, whereas most raids are absolutely not like that. So... Bad thing, good thing, you decide. But I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Uh, if you have any questions, make sure to leave them in the comments. Um, this team is very active like on YouTube and on social media in general. So I'm sure if you have questions, they'll probably answer in my comment section if they're around. Um, next up, we have Crota. And then we're done. And then we're done. And then I'll probably go back to making other videos. Maybe I'll talk about dungeons at some point because I know some of you were asking about that. But um, that's pretty much it for Root of Nightmares. So I'll see you guys later. And hopefully Crota will not be... Not take me like a week to make this this video took a lot of takes all right anyways bye bye